I'm going to kick things off, and uh, I think we'll have a few others joining us. I do see some folks coming on. So, um, Jeff, uh, Stump, and I, as chairs of this committee, welcome you. Just to be sure you're at the right place, this is the quarterly meeting of uh, the Marin Conservation League's Agricultural Land Use Committee. Um, really, thank you for making time again on a Friday morning like this. Uh, we're very excited about today's agenda, and I'll share that here in a minute. But uh, first, want to do a couple just quick housekeeping items. Uh, first, um, just know that we use the chat, um, and and Jeff will help monitor that for questions that we can then bring to presenters and panelists, and we'll go over the agenda a little more, as I said. But just really, please use the chat. Um, and then, if I decide to open it up for discussion, there is an agenda item where we want to just open up and get input. Uh, we use the raise hand feature, and I'll prompt you again on that so that we have kind of an order of who, who wanted to share a comment or a question. Um, let me uh, do a couple things, just uh, all things MCL, all things Marine Conservation League. And, uh, you know, here we are in 2022, it's, it's uh, July. Um, the board and the organization is really happy to share with you, really excited to share with you. Uh, our most recent annual report, and that's in the chat now for you, a really beautifully done and, and uh, great uh, presentation of different accomplishments over the past year. So please, you know, if you haven't gotten a copy of that already, um, there's the link for you. Um, and that lets me then um, do a little advocacy for ourselves and just maybe recruiting. Um, if you're a member, you'll get that report mailed to you. So that's one of the perks of being a member of the Marine Conservation League. Um, and I'm gonna put, you know, control C, I'm gonna put uh, how to become a member in the chat. So if you're interested and, and wanna learn more about what it is to be a member, please, there's a number of board members on this uh, and, and MCL members on this call. Feel free to reach out to any one of us ask us what it's about to be a member. But another thing you'd get as a member um, is our e-news and our newsletters. And so I'll put that link in and you can go and um, go and look at the most recent issues of our e-news that come out weekly and then our newsletters that come out every other month. Um, and it's those are the places we either update you about all the things happening with MCL or in the new case of the newsletter, take deep dives on issues and give you uh, where MCL's positions are and, and give you context and information uh, about all of the activities that MCL is doing. So those are just a couple things. And I just, if you're not a member, I hope you'll consider it. And otherwise, please go and read our annual report and save the news link so that you can find our newsletters going forward. You don't have to be a member to go to our website and see those things. and and have them as part of your uh, source of information. Um, so then with that, let me share the agenda. And just get a kind of a thumbs up um, and just any other things that folks might wanna add. And, um, you know, taking care of introductions, I'll do that here in a minute, reviewing the agenda now. We're really lucky to have a combination of, of partners, local organizations and agency representatives that are working closely on coho recovery in the Walker Creek watershed. Um, this collaboration is ramping up and doing some amazing work, but I think it's also important to appreciate that it's been a multi-decadal, taken many years to, to get to this point, and you're gonna hear a little bit about the history that's allowed uh, and the work that's gone on over 10, 20, 30 years that's allowed this partnership to be at this stage of, of planning and implementing recovery of coho salmon in that watershed. Um, and then the other issue we're gonna, or agenda item that we'll have is we're gonna talk just briefly about uh, the existing agricultural policy statement for the Marine Conservation League and some steps forward. Um, so uh, with that, um, maybe I'll stop share and just ask, are there any other questions about the agenda? or things people wanted to, to maybe see if we could handle through the wrap up part at the end. Um, okay, if you don't have anything, didn't, didn't ask you to come with agenda items, but just in case, just wanted to double check. Okay, great. Um, you can kind of see in the participant list who's joined us, um, you know, as, as is kind of my habit, I share to help you make introductions. 
uh, I share the registration list. So this is who's uh, registered for this meeting. I see we have about 19 people. I think we had 26 or 27 register. So um, let you just kind of read that for a minute. Um, July, we tend to have lower attendance in July. I think lots of people traveling at least can travel now, right, this year, if you think about this time last year. So, uh, but we are recording this. I was the last part I wanted to say is we are recording this and like all of our committees uh, meetings that there'll be a chance should you have missed this or wanna share this presentation with someone else, we'll have a recording for it. Um, so anything else, Jeff, housekeeping I'm forgetting or just, other just general for the good of the order comments anybody has? Um, David, I guess I just reflect on the success of Measure A. We haven't met as a group and really want to acknowledge the work of our colleagues on, on the board. I think we really made a difference in, in making sure that the 20% you know, funding stayed in the agricultural area and, and being able to increase funding to the RCD you know, through uh, our work with a lot of partners to support Measure A. It really paid off so pretty happy about that really really good point and, and i'll just add two things one is just if if again we could uh share our gratitude to susan stomp and her leadership uh in representing mcl and leading our efforts through and with an, a, a large coalition on that so thank you susan very very much um and uh in, in thanking you, just want to uh, confirm for this group, the next meeting, and I'll, I'll say it again in the wrap up, but our next meeting is in October. I think it's, um, I forget if it's October 27th or 29th. I'll look and get the date when we wrap up. But that last Friday in October and um, Max Corton and Kevin Wright are already tentatively scheduled to come and give us a, a complete overview of the sustainable ag portion of Measure A. So we'll have them come and, and talk about all three elements within that sustainable ag portion. And Nona, that um, uh, comes from your genius and recommendation for that topic. So thank you for suggesting that. I have already gotten them tentatively scheduled. 1028, Jeff's put it in there. So put, make sure that's on your calendar, Friday, October 28th. But good point, Jeff. Uh, I think we're all relieved and reaffirmed by the result of Measure A. Yeah. Um, so with that, I'd like to just dive in and, and I'm gonna share that this is a panel structure. We have a number of presenters as the agenda shared with you. I'd like to work through their presentations. They're, they're promised to keep things around a 10 minute mark, maybe 15 when there's a couple speakers. Um, and so be ready with pen and paper, make some notes so that you can be asking questions in the chat or as we then open it up to full discussion with the panel, uh, we can have that dialogue and 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 field your questions. Um, and so with that, I'm going to first invite uh, Nancy Scolari, the executive director for Marin Resource Conservation District, and Sarah Phillips, their urban streams program manager, to talk about the RCD's role and and activities. And really, the title the title of their topic is the history of restoration planning and project implementation in the Walker Creek watershed. So Nancy, Sarah, the floor is yours for, for the next 10, 15 minutes. Thanks. Um, I'm going to need uh, to share my screen. I thought I gave everybody share screen. Is it not working for you? No. Nope. Oh, now it is. Okay. Maybe because you came on either way. Yeah. Oh, okay. Thumbs up. All it's, right. Uh, as long as it's working for you. Yep, we got you. Okay, great. Um, okay, hi, everybody. Um, just wanted to also, again, thank you for um, for Marine Conservation League and support of Measure A. And it's just such a huge boost. I think in this presentation, you'll see some of the pro these projects were done through Measure A, but, but also um, that was just at $100,000 a year. So I think we can really boost this up in years to come. So I'm gonna start why, um, like I said, giving you a little history about a little snapshot into Walker Creek. So what you see here is um, really an amazing, beautiful piece of property looking down onto a stretch of creek um, that not many people get to um, and, and just an amazing, beautiful riparian corridor, really lush, um, very inaccessible to the public. And much of Walker Creek is like that. Um, let's see here, let me make sure I can forward there. So Walker Creek is 
a really pretty big chunk of Marin County. Um, so if you can see this on the map, it's sort of it's 76 square miles in total. And uh, you know, you don't probably see most of it because it's 98% privately owned. It's in livestock and dairy ranching. And um, so if you can see there at that, well, let me switch to the next slide. At the northern end, you see the town of Tamales there by the green dot. And then if you look more um, easterly, you'll see that it, it actually bleeds out into Sonoma County by um, Chileno Valley. And then way down south, it, you get into like uh, the Point Reyes Petaluma Road area. So many people cross through the watershed at its headwaters and you don't even know it most of the time. Um, there are different parts of the watershed. Um, the green dot there in the map is telling you where we're at. So this is down by the Highway 1 Walker Creek Bridge. And um, as you can see, it's just sort of like a flat floodplain down there. Then it's very sinuous and moving. Um, Sarah's going to talk about a pro really great project that we have facing the Highway 1 Bridge facing east. So um, that's yet to come. but. Here's another snapshot. This is um, the purple dot there is near the confluence of Walker and Chileno Creek. This is really inaccessible. You don't see this very often. I myself have not been in this part of the creek. It's really lush, vegetated. Um, here's Laguna Lake. And this is a really beautiful natural lake that rests on the Sonoma Marin border. And it's also, it's 200 acres. It's also home to about 5,000 newts, um, California newts. And so um, there is an entire newt brigade that, that actually shepherds, um, carries newts across the road here. And, um, and here further down the road is the newt brigade headquarters. <laughs> this is the Gale Ranch. So um, for those of you who actually are part of that program, um, they generally meet here and, and discuss how to strategize on how to care, care for those newts. But that corridor that you see there is um, uh, the a riparian restoration project that was done with the RCD uh, about 20, 25 years ago at this point. So um, really looking beautiful. Then here's Walker Creek Ranch. That's sort of in the fisheries section of the watershed. Um, Here's also around the same area, Frank Canyon, another uh, sh snapshot of, of that same area. And then you have Sulahuli Reservoir, which is, um, you know, if you see there on the blue dot, it's actually closer to Point Reyes Petaluma Road more than anything else, although you don't see it. So, um, so that's just kind of what that watershed looks like in different, in different areas. And then I just wanted to get into um, the, what the RCD has done over the years. So back in 2001, the RCD worked with all of those ranchers. Um, I remember I was there 20 years ago, 25 years ago, we were going on one-on-one -on -one vi visits with ranches, trying to create a watershed plan and came up with five goals, um, support a strong ag economy, provide clear inf factual information on the issues facing Walker Creek, help landowners implement projects, provide education for the public, and work with regulatory agencies to reduce the burden that they have when they're implementing these projects. So we've been operating on this plan along with many partners for, um, you know, for a couple decades now. Um, some of the things, some of the critters we're trying to protect here are the usual suspects. You have coho salmon, sealhead trout, uh, red-legged frog, freshwater shrimp, tamales roach, and northwestern pond turtle. Um, through the years, we've been, um, the ranchers have been participating in these programs. Um, all of those that you see highlighted in green are ranches who have participated in one way or, or another. So they have implemented projects. Um, most of them have all implemented projects, whether it's riparian restoration or what have you, and I'll show you pictures. But, um, but some of them are just doing studies um, and working with um, some of the agencies that you're gonna hear about today. Here are the different families that have um, completed projects and the agencies and organizations. Like I said, there's many of them. And um, the types are culverts, done a lot of culverting, um, no new culverts, just replacing culverts. 
um, for fish passage reasons and um, also just because for uh, agricultural access reasons. Um, gullies, lots and lots of gullies, more than anything else, probably the restoration um, and stabilization of gullies. This is in um, Chilena Valley. Um, this is also in Chilena Valley. A lot of riparian planting projects have been completed with Point Blue and the students and teachers restoring a watershed. Actually, all of our projects have been with them. Um, stream banks, a lot of stream bank repair. This is the Barboni Ranch uh, closer to the Sulahuli Reservoir. And then grade stabilization projects. This is the Brazil Ranch. And if you can tell, we try to make them look so that there's nothing ever done there. <laughs> That's the goal, right? Is just to make them look really beautiful. Um, here is the Parks Ranch. This is outside of Tamales, and this is drainage coming off of Highway 1. And then swales, anything having to do with non-point source pollution reduction type projects, we've worked on many of those. And um, all told, we've done, uh, you know, this is actually an old slide, so I don't know, 50, 60 type projects, I would estimate. I'm not exactly sure. We're going to have to tally it up, but quite a few. A lot of biotechnical repairs like you see here. And then um, 20 miles of stream and gully restoration throughout the watershed. Um, that, which means fencing out creeks, putting in water developments, um, so uh, planting, lots of planting, many, many trees, thousands and thousands of trees. And then funding for all of that has come to us through different sources. Very um, grateful to have a lot, a large chunk come from Coastal Conservancy and the Water Board. Um, also, Unsung Hero is um, USDA through their Farm Bill program provides uh, quite a bit of money each year through the Natural Resources Conservation Service. And then down in Measure A and MALT, um, this is an old slide, so those, those numbers would actually be increased um, quite a bit um, if I were to um, revamp this slide a bit. And then I'm going to let, i um, going to go ahead and hand it off to Sarah, and she's going to talk about fish and wildlife and their latest contribution to the watershed. Awesome. Thank you so much, Nancy. Um, I did realize as much as I was trying to avoid any kind of electronic glitches, I will need you to pass the screen share over to me when I finish with the slides, just so I can pop up the website. So just a heads up on that. Um, okay. So good morning, everybody. Uh, oh, okay. I can do it now then. Hold on. Um, David, can you enable me to share my screen? Could you please? And insert Jeopardy music right now. No, it's good. Sarah, try it again. You should be able to. It says host disabled participant screen sharing. Mm. Nancy, isn't this great? I like tried to <laughs> try to avoid this very moment. I was texting with Nancy before this. I'm I was like, so let's see sorry. This and let's avoid uh, this moment. I'm not sure what try it I'm again. Sure. Yeah, try it again. Because I've I've un I've I have all participants allow share. Yeah, host disabled participant screen sharing. Before Nancy popped hers up, I was able to because I just checked it. Ooh, here we go, here we go. Yes, okay, we're going in. Uh, let's go in the slide. Okay. okay. Can you can you see it? We've got your slide deck up. Oh. And. We see we see the slide that you handed that Nancy handed off to you. Mm -hmm. Okay, great. Let's, let's go. Oh, you do see where she handed it off to me. Yeah, in other words, it's it's still the slide uh, deck and not it, the slide sorter and not the show. How's that? Bravo! There's show now. Yeah. Yep. Okay. All right. Sorry. This is exactly what I was trying to avoid, but here we are. Okay, so. Not a problem. <laughs> thank you. I'm gonna try to restart on my time and just make sure I make this as quick as possible. So as of right now, um, I haven't worked that much in Walker Creek, but I, I'm getting my feet wet and I'm learning fast. So with Walker Creek, with Lower Walker, as Nancy had mentioned, a project that um, seems like it was just recently funded, but you know, time has kind of been elastic in the pandemic. So it started in May, 2020. 
It's funded by Department of Fish and Wildlife's FRGP, the Fisheries Restoration Grant Program. It's called Lower Walker Creek Floodplain Habitat Assessment and Design. So it's all about the planning and assessment and design Sarah, aspects of a project. Yes. Sorry, sorry to interrupt you. Try sharing one more time. I, I think I think oh, Zoom. I, I think Zoom is delaying us. <laughs> um. Did that do anything? Can you see? Don't see it yet. Oh, that's so weird. Um, yeah, I see it on both of my screens. Let me close and try again. I really think Zoom, there's a delay in Zoom today. So we just be patient there's with each other. There's definitely a delay. Oh, oh, it's now telling me the host disabled participant screen sharing. No, give it, give it a minute. I'm not going to. And we'll we'll make time. You can start from the top, and you'll have time. I so appreciate try, that. Try it Sorry. one more time. You should you should have the capacity. Um, worst case scenario, if Nancy still has the ability to share her screen, I can just have her thumb through, and then just pull up the website, or just I'll put the website in the link. Yeah, yeah. And try it one more. Oh yeah, I'm trying like nonstop. I hit share screen and then I hit okay. And then I hit share screen. It keeps telling me that host disabled participant screen sharing. I don't, I mean, it's on, I, on my end, I see allow participants to share screen and it's unchecked. Okay, I'm Nancy, go are you time. able to still pull up the, the PowerPoint? Yes. All yours, all I... yours Sarah, give it a go. <gasps> How did you know? Okay, let's try it again. Share. Okay. Thank you all for your patience. Sarah, you have the floor and the time you need. Okay, what are you seeing? Are you actually seeing where I left off? Your yes. slide sorter and the slide where you left off, yep. Okay, great. Can you see the mess on the side as far as we like do all see the mess on the side, the slide sorter. So all right, all right, start. from current slide. Here we go. How's that? Thumbs up. Uh, okay. we're seeing notes and the next slide. There you go. Perfect. Okay. I'm not touching anything. <laughs> Me okay. neither. All right. We're good. Um, so this project, I'm not going to go all the way from the beginning, but anyway, it's about three and a half thousand dollars. Um, it started in May, 2020. It closes out in, in March, 2024. It was originally going to close out in 2023, but Thankfully, CDFW uh, was kind enough to grant us an extension for a year to get all the data we needed. Um, it is managed by myself at the Marin RCD. Our lead consultant team is at Pineski Chatham Incorporated. And so far we have um, five landowners that are working with us on this project and they're directly upstream of the Highway 1 bridge. Nancy had an image of that earlier. A couple of the landowners are right down there and then a couple more upstream. And it's a really fascinating area of Walker Creek because it's tidally influenced and there's a lot of room for, for bigger projects. And right now we're in the current phase of early conceptual design. So um, keep an eye out, but this project overall will have um, the following goals. So again, collecting more information, understanding that relationship between the channels, the floodplains, the habitat conditions overall for Salmonids and that, that tidally influenced area, that really sweet spot of estuary stream ecotone transition. Um, this project is also gonna result in a habitat and plant enhancement plan, documenting the existing conditions and the different opportunities to enhance or create off-channel habitat and in-stream complexity. Um, and with that being said, it's gonna be producing three 100% restoration designs for high priority sites that are identified. And again, they're in the conceptual design phase right now. Um, but the goal of this, like the overarching goal is just better understanding what's going on in this reach of Walker Creek watershed, working with private property owners to really just have a big bang for the buck and doing some large scale restoration projects and having a roadmap for agencies and organizations to look to different projects and restoration needs within the lower Walker Creek floodplains, in addition to reducing downstream flooding by spreading that water out and really taking advantage of the floodplains. 
So we're also working with Walker Creek Ranch. Um, I feel like everybody is working with Walker Creek Ranch. They're just such a great partner and easy to work with. Um, we currently are partnering with U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service to secure funding to implement these projects that were identified in a Pacific Watersheds Associates PWA uh, assessment that they did for us, also funded by Department of Fish and Wildlife. Um, they identified a number of priority sites where we could do some restoration actions, a lot of biotechnical bank repair work to reduce fine sediment input into Walker Creek watershed. So we're going to be looking into how which priority projects are there that we can go ahead and start getting funding for. Um, specifically, U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service and I are looking at areas that we can increase our um, groundwater storage, that we can also improve water quality, and hopefully with these process-based restoration techniques, create some low burn zones with saturated areas by reconnecting the floodplains. Um, to learn more, so let's see if I can which I don't know, I'm kind of afraid to even like stop sharing this screen and try to share my other screen, but we have an amazing website. Um, if you go to Marin RCD and you go under programs, you can click on the Walker Creek project page. It goes through the projects in detail um, that I mentioned to you guys as well. It talks about some of the monitoring efforts that are going to be spoken about next with this morning's meeting. And with that, I just want to say thank you all so much for the invitation to be here this morning and to be able to speak with you all about Walker Creek Watershed. It's, it's a watershed near and dear to many of us. And as Nancy said, not a lot of folks get to see it with 98% privately owned. So just really appreciate um, the invitation to join you all. And if I can, I'm going to see if it'll let me switch. Sarah, I put the link. You try, try. I put the link for the website into the chat for everyone else to also go and, and okay. do, do their own search, but go ahead and try. Okay. So Nona, very quickly while Sarah's showing the website, is quick question. No, a little comment, and that is a, just to fill in a little piece of unknown history about Walker Creek, and that is in the early 70s, before Sulahuli, it must have been very early 70s, before Sulahuli actually became a, uh, a final concept, for MMWD to establish a new water, a new reservoir, Middle Walker Creek was the focus. And uh, so what might have happened, it's hard to say, I guess that would be below the, the confluence. Is it so Sol that comes out of uh, Sulahuli? Whatever creek that comes out of Sulahuli and joins uh, and, and becomes Middle Walker uh, was going to be a reservoir. That was, a, that was the prospect that MMWD had in mind before Sulahuli. Just a little bit of history to fill in. Uh, it might have changed a lot on Walker Creek. So thanks very much. Thanks, Nona. Yeah. yeah. So share with us the map quickly, Sarah, and then okay. we'll um, we'll move okay. on to the next speaker. And okay. I do see you, but I'm going to ask you to hold your comment if I can, and we'll get to the next speaker. Go ahead, Sarah. Thank you. Um, this is what the website looks like. The different projects are down here. You All you have to do is just click on it, opens up, gives you more information and contact information for who's the lead. Um, super fascinating, but the, I think the coolest thing about this is if you come and click on the interactive project map, this is where you can really geek out and you can look at the floodplain study. This is the area that, of the project that we're working on currently um, in the lower reaches, but you can also look at where the small trap was installed. All kinds of different information. So just wanted to share that for your, your future geeking out on Walker Creek and learning more and becoming familiar with the watershed. Excellent. Thank Excellent. you. Yeah, thank you. And thank you for your perseverance through the technical glitch and maybe even what might have been operator error on my part. So my no apologies. Worries. We're all um, next up we have Jonathan Kohler from Marin Water and Jonathan's the fisheries program manager. And I know Eric Atlinger is here in the wings as well, but I think Jonathan, you're primarily gonna lead the presentation and we're grateful for your time today. Um, and again, the title of, of this part of the panel presentation is, Water, is Walker Creek Low Flow Monitoring and a Royal Sossel Spawner Survey. So some great monitoring of coho themselves at, at different life stages. Jonathan, thank you. And hopefully screen share is working for you. Yeah, morning everybody, um, I'll try to Share my screen. Thank you very much for having um, me and Eric. And yeah, I'm a relative newcomer to the Walker Creek watershed, so I'll certainly lean on Eric to provide a little bit of uh, context as needed. 
I'm going to try to. So, what can you can you We've guys got see? Your slide here? sorter, your slide sorter showing up. Yeah, and if you start showing. All right. Let's see. Um, go here. That better? Yes. You see this? Perfect. You see the slideshow? Okay. Perfect. The, the lead slides up clear as a bell. Great. So, um, what I'll be talking about today is some work we did in um, Arroyo Sasol last uh, year over the winter, and then uh, low flow monitoring in, in Walker Creek last summer due to um, really the unprecedented drought conditions that we saw. So I'll start with Arroyo Sasol. Um, and this was um, really initiated by the regional board. The regional board had reached out to Marine Water for um, a while to get um, information on habitat conditions in Arroyo Sasol. And this is uh, just to orient everybody. You can, can you see my mouse cursor? Okay, so here is Sulahuli Reservoir. Here's uh, the valve, uh, the release point. And then here's Arroyo Sasol that flows downstream and joins in with Salmon Creek to form Walker Creek. Um, and so it's really this little stretch of creek that uh, Nona actually just uh, mentioned that there wasn't a whole lot of information, a lot of current information on what habitat conditions um, are like there. And the question from the regional board was, um, are fish potentially using that? Is there habitat for fish to use um, that stretch of creek? It is a really, really challenging uh, channel to get down into. It's deeply incised and completely overgrown by, uh, by willow and other um, vegetation, blackberries, poison oak, all of the nasty stuff that's not very nice to walk through. Um, it's also got cattle uh, grazing in the area, so it's a challenge to get down there. Um, nevertheless, last September, we got into the creek and surveyed this stretch from basically our parking lot here at Sulahuli Reservoir downstream to uh, the confluence of Salmon Creek. And um, really, we called this a reconnaissance survey because it was uh, just to get uh, an idea of where fish could potentially spawn um, and what, what habitat conditions were like. So it was, you know, 0.64 miles in total. And the yellow dots, hopefully you can see that, um, were the riffles we found. We found 10 potential spawning riffles. This is where salmon would prefer to spawn. Um, and of those 10, I think eight of them were deemed uh, unsuitable because there really is no spawning gravel in this reach. It's below Sulahuli Reservoir, um, and not surprisingly, there, it's very coarse sediment, cobbles, boulders, um, some bedrock. So not a lot of great spawning habitat, um, very limited. In fact, I'll show you some pictures in a second. Um, the good news, I suppose, or one, one uh, bit of good news was that we didn't find any passage barriers. There was a concern that perhaps this old bridge uh, structure, um, there's a concrete apron that crosses the channel there, might be hindering fish access to this uh, portion of the stream, but it's, um, it's really dilapidated and there's a, there's a natural channel around it. So fish theoretically could, could come out of Walker Creek, just swim all the way to the top, and of course, the major fish passage barrier is the dam. So um, I'm talking about in the survey reach, there was no uh, fish passage barrier. Here's some uh, pictures of what habitat conditions look like um, in Arroyo Sasol. It was very turbid. Um, this is a, a condition we observed throughout uh, the following winter as well. So water coming out of the reservoir tends to be um, this kind of cloudy, milky color. Um, this is the riffle. This was actually one of the highest quality potential spawning riffles we thought fish would could uh, use this winter. Um, this is immediately below the dam or, or very close below the dam. And then they get progressively worse um, as you go downstream towards um, Walker Creek, Salmon, Salmon Creek. This is a, a pretty typical riffle. It's hard to convey this in pictures because of the turbidity, but the substrate there are really um, like bowling ball sized boulders, um, really big cobble material, essentially coho, steelhead, um, chinook really couldn't move uh, to construct a red or a spawning, you know, spawning site. So pretty tough um, place for fish. Um, so in, you know, after that survey in September, we then went out in uh, basically after every storm during uh, last winter, and looked for fish. So we did spawner, the standard spawner surveys um, from November through April. This is what conditions looked like um, later in the season. This is a pretty decent spawning 
um, potential spawning site in April. Um, and the short story is this, um, zeros. We just didn't see any activity, um, no evidence of spawning in Arroyo Sasol uh, proper. We did see spawning in Salmon Creek. So that, you know, the, the tributary, um, you know, that sort of branches off there right at the base of Arroyo Sasol. Uh, we did see, I think a total of seven reds. I have a note here, yes, seven reds. Um, six of those were identified as steelhead. One was an unknown red. So could have been coho. Um, Cal trout and uh, I think it's just cow trout. Sarah can correct me if I'm wrong there, but um, does spawner surveys down a little lower and uh, CDFW may as well too. So we, we may hear about that, but really the, the, the focus of our monitoring was Arroyo Sasol and we just didn't see any, um, any spawning activity. It was a very active early portion. So here's the hydrograph from the, from the um, last winter. You can see very dry going in, low flows, two CFS coming in from the summer. We had that big uh, atmospheric river in October, the big storm of the year, and then a very active uh, series of storms that made it tough to actually get out there and look for fish. Um, and then really a very quiet hydrograph um, thereafter. So we didn't really get any significant rainfall oops, until um, or after, after January. So um, you can see the dates of our surveys. And like I said, just not a lot of activity. So um, shifting gears a little bit, another uh, monitoring uh, task we did last year, this was in response to the really low flows in Walker Creek. Um, so typically Moran water releases between four and five CFS during the summer months into Walker, uh, but due to Sula Huli being uh, very, very low. And uh, for the first time in many, many years, maybe ever, uh, Marin Water actually withdrew water from Sula Huli over to Nicasio and further lowered uh, the reservoir. So um, the releases into Walker were, were very low. Two CFS was the agreed upon um, level, and that hadn't really been done. Um, so what we did was set up these three low flow monitoring reaches um, in Walker Creek. They were each about 500 and 50 or so feet long. Um, they were comprised of different habitat types of five riffles, five, four to five riffles, three to four pools. And you can see their locations here. This one is um, right at the confluence of Salmon Creek and then the, it extends down right where the Marin Motorcycle Club is. Um, then this one on Walker Creek Ranch. And then uh, big thanks to the um, Marin RCB for helping us get access, uh, Sarah and Nancy, uh, helped us get access to the Brazil ranch down here in the lower portion of the creek. Um, and we just monitored essentially very basic habitat conditions. We took photographs. Um, we measured air and water temperature throughout the summer to see what conditions would potentially be like for, for fish. Um, we measured something called riffle crest thalweg depth, which if you um, have never heard that term, you can think about the shallow point in a riffle um, that's really the, the lane that kind of connects um, habitat. So pool to pool, they have to go through that depth. It gives us a good measurement of, of like connectivity between pools, how fish are able to move around during the summer, um, maximum pool depths. And then we also noted uh, what fish or any other aquatic species we saw. This is what the hydrograph last summer looked like. Um, so it's on a logarithmic scale. So this is one CFS. You can see here's two CFS, that's low. Um, typically the summer base flow would be up around four to five CFS. You can see we were lower than that. Did creep up around four. Um, it's difficult to know whether these values are real in all honesty. USGS does some um, kind of magic with some of their flows in post-processing and this is tentative, but nevertheless, low flow all last summer and we were out uh, looking at conditions throughout. Um, we developed these photo monitoring logs. So each visit you can see the date, the flow, and then what habitat conditions look like. And we did this at standard points um, for each one of those sites. A lot of data, something like 300 and I think 380 individual <laughs> observations last summer, so it's pretty data intensive, um, but it gave us a good sense of how habitat conditions were persisting over the summer. That was really the, the goal of the project. 
And here's what we, um, we saw. Um, all of the sites maintained connectivity, which was reassuring to CFS, although it's very low, is still significantly higher than what we think the system naturally would have. It probably would go much lower than that, maybe even less than a CFS, perhaps even dry in some reaches in some years. So, so two CFS did maintain um, connectivity to all of the habitat remained connected at all of our sites throughout the entire summer. The shallowest part, you can see again that riffle crest fall wag um, value, that's what RCT is, six centimeters, that's two tenths of a foot. So that's a couple inches deep. Um, that's deep enough for you know, certainly young coho, young salmonids to move around. Um, we didn't really see any indication that fish were being isolated in one area or another. Um, we did observe uh, steelhead, juvenile steelhead in all three reaches. So all the way, um, at our highest, middle, and lower reaches, coho were really only observed at the lower two. It got pretty warm up around uh, Motorcycle Club, the, the uppermost reach below the reservoir. Not too surprisingly, the reservoir was really low. We were drawing out of basically a, a warm bathtub at that point. Um, and you can see, so what we're looking at here is water temperatures. Blue is the upstream most site. Red is the second, is sort of the middle site. And green is the, the lower site. So. This is actually a little surprising to me, although um, it does make sense because the creek does generally flow from a warmer part of the watershed to a cooler part of the watershed, probably picks up some groundwater influence, but essentially um, it was warmer at the top and coldest at the bottom. And I will say it, it was downright cold um, down at Brazil Ranch. The water was very cold. And again, these are just, um, these are just spot measurements. These aren't continuous data logger measurement. So if we really wanted a detail account, we would have to do more um, detailed monitoring. But these are good indicators, I feel. Um, we collected the data at the warmest por portion of the day, typically in the early afternoon. We wouldn't expect these values to get much higher. And I think we got enough data points to where we didn't really miss any real heat spikes. But um, interesting trend where the, the creek does uh, get cooler as it goes downstream. Um, and then finally, we are just uh, continuing this again this summer. So we're going out on a biweekly basis as often as possible. And just for comparison purposes, now that Sulahuli is full, um, to see what the difference um, is in terms of, mostly in terms of temperature and habitat conditions. That's what is most interesting to me. And that's all I have. So thank you very much. Jonathan, thank you. And, and maybe have you unshare and just Eric is, is uh, before we move to the next panel and the next panelist on the next topic, right anything go. Jonathan and Eric want to share in addition? Wonderful though, great to see that data and, and the continuation of it as well. And what, I know there'll be questions, we'll want to come back to it. Um, okay, uh, with that then, I, I want to ask uh, David Hines to, to come up and uh, David comes to us from the California Department of Fish and Wildlife. Uh, where he is, uh, you know, oversees and, and operates the the Bay Delta region coho salmon recovery and as the coordinator. Um, and David, just thank you for your time today. Uh, t the title of David's talk is Coho Salmon Reintroduction in Walker Creek. And so, David, the floor is yours for the next ten minutes or so. Yeah. All right. Thank you, David. Um, let's see if I can manage the screen share thing here. I should have closed out all my other stuff. Oh, no problem. Yeah. Okay. Are you seeing? Um, we do see. Uh, we see your PowerPoint slide sorter, and there you go. Uh, the lead slide right. up and running. All yours. Okay. Well, thank you. And um, I'm going to just go over some of the recent uh, actions CDFW has taken uh, to reintroduce coho salmon to Walker Creek. Uh, the Walker Creek watershed, and Monica Tonti, who's on the call today, um, uh, is my colleague and has contributed substantially to um, what I'm going to be presenting today. Let me get rid of that. Oops, I'm goofing this up already. All right, so uh, uh, our primary goal for uh, Walker Creek is to 
reestablish a population of coho salmon, which um, uh, were presumed to be extirpated. And um, uh, now they're not, which is great news. And I'll, I'll get into that. Um, and Jody, I presume we'll be talking a little bit more about recovery criteria, but um, Walker Creek is strategically important to the overall uh, survival and recovery of coho salmon um, in the California coastal ESU, coastal California. What is it? She'll, she'll tell you. Anyway, uh, uh, so yeah, by, by bringing Walker Creek online, we have yet another population that can help um, add resilience to neighbor, neighboring populations through um, straying and um, providing um, genetic material between watersheds. And the ultimate goal is really to um, meet both the state and federal recovery criteria and ultimately uh, delist the species. And this graph shows uh, the stocking history in Walker Creek. So the blue bars are the um, adult salmon uh, we've released beginning in 2004 and annually since uh, 2018. And the orange bars show uh, the juvenile coho salmon that we've released um, annually since 2010. And uh, these fish were sourced from uh, both the Russian River and Alima Creek populations. So this history of stocking sort of begs the question of whether this is a, a effective strategy or not. So we've been asking ourselves a, a number of questions. Um, among them are, are the juveniles that we put in the watershed surviving through the winter and emigrating as smolts? Uh, are the adults we introduce into the watershed distributing themselves um, and actually spawning and reproducing? And are there young surviving um, both the incubation and rearing life stages? Um, and those that do survive and uh, emigrate as smolts, are they returning as adults? And uh, you know, what is the impact of that over time? Or what's the fraction of, of fish that are of natural origin um, compared to those uh, that we're uh, continuing to introduce into the watershed? And ultimately, we're wanting to know um, how close we are to a viable population. Are these fish producing enough adults uh, to replace um, the the adults from the prior generation, which is uh, a key metric in, in population viability. So uh, I'm showing this one slide, although it's not uh, relating specifically to Walker Creek, it, it is uh, information that's helping us answer some of these questions and Salmon Creek, just to the north, uh, we're doing a, a similar program of reintrodu reintroduction and uh, we've been collecting uh, young of the year and taking genetic uh, samples from them and uh, sending that to the uh, NOAA Science Center lab in Santa Cruz. And they've been doing um, a parentage analysis. So they're able to uh, determine uh, whether or not the parents of these young fish are uh, from hatchery origin or, or not. And the, um, if they're not, they're presumed to be natural origin parents. And uh, the pie chart on the right shows um, the proportions uh, of the results there. And of course, uh, the ma majority or the largest fraction uh, are, um, are hatchery fish that paired up and spawned and reproduced. That's important uh, to understand that uh, the release is actually showing some signs of um, successful reproduction. But uh, it's also very interesting to see that there are um, natural origin pairings um, indicating that there are fish coming in uh, from the ocean that, um, you know, mostly, most likely they're, you know, first, second generation from the hatchery um, fish or second or third generation, I mean. But uh, it's, it's good to see that there's that sort of um, natural origin reproduction happening. And uh, so uh, we've committed to uh, some um, 
lifecycle monitoring uh, to help us answer uh, the questions uh, specific to, to Walker Creek. And what is common to, to a lot of the biological monitoring that occurs, which is we wanna estimate how many fish are coming into the watershed and then how many fish are subsequently coming out of the watershed. And that's uh, sort of a key population metric on uh, relating to watershed performance. So in terms of the number of adults uh, coming into the watershed, we've um, begun a project in partnership with Cal Trout uh, that I believe it was Nancy um, mentioned earlier, um, using these pit tag antennas, and I'll, I'll uh, show another slide on that in a minute. Uh, and as Jonathan um, mentioned, there are some spawning surveys that um, are sort of um, very limited in scope. And that's one area that we'd like to um, expand on. Uh, but really what uh, CDFW is um, spending most of its time on in terms of monitoring is estimating smoke production in migrant trap. And uh, I'll talk about that in a second. There are a number of monitoring questions that are still unanswered. Um, obviously the spawning one I mentioned, uh, but also juvenile abundance of distribution and life stage specific survival rates uh, for these fish and uh, including small to adult returns. Okay, so for the uh, PIT antenna detection project, so PIT stands for Passive Integrated Transponder. They're small devices that are implanted in the hatchery fish before they're released into the watershed. And the map on the right shows uh, at the bottom, you can see the town of Tamales and one of the adult release locations down there. And then <clears throat> moving upstream, uh, you can see the first antenna is on the Brazil property. And then there's quite a bit of stream. And then um, we get two more antennas up here around the Walker Creek Ranch property. And the juvenile releases occur up, up top on the Walker Creek property. And you can see that's where Sulahuli. Uh, is just for reference. So we're able then to see when we put the adults in, are they moving up into their spawning areas? Um, and the juveniles, are they um, moving out uh, in the spring as smolts? Uh, the, while the, um, the antenna project is really useful, uh, I do believe that we need to have um, comprehensive spawning surveys to really get a good estimate of um, the adult uh, abundance and effective um, reproduction. <clears throat> so this is uh, just a basic summary of some of the results. The, the antenna project started two years ago. So we're, we're just kind of ramping things up and we have a lot more work to do on interpreting the results, but this just shows you the frequency of detections. Uh, the the uh, group on the left are from the Brazil ranch, and then this is up towards the Walker Creek ranch. And then on the x-axis is the month, so 12 is December. Uh, we've released the adults in late December, early January, so um, not surprising that we're seeing the, the most detections in those two months. Uh, but it is interesting to see that um, we're still picking up fish uh, into April. And then we're seeing fewer at the upper antenna, but still um, quite a few, which shows that they are moving. Um, oh yeah, and we don't have an antenna in Chileno Creek. So that's a major tributary uh, that the adults are likely um, moving up into, but uh, we don't know at this point. Okay, and so this year was the first year that we uh, implemented uh, the small uh, abundance estimates using a uh, uh, funnel net um, trap. And you can see in the photo, we, we set up these weir panels that uh, they're screened, so the water passes through, but the fish get routed into this um, central area and down uh, the net and they funnel into this slide box. Um, 
It's a very important uh, method for estimating uh, watershed production of smolts. And um, we have a lot more work like with, uh, similar to the pit project, we uh, have a lot of work to do to analyze the results um, among those uh, trap efficiency, uh, overwinter um, growth and survival of the stocked fish and the um, relative abundance condition of, um, of the smolts. Uh, this table shows uh, our results from this year. This is the actual catch numbers. And um, uh, you can see that we caught just over 2,000 coho salmon smolts, which is terrific. We, we saw very few uh, um, steelhead smolts, which was interesting. Um, I think because our installation date was pretty late, it missed um, much, hopefully, much of the uh, population there. We did see a lot of young of the year steelhead. I think it was a, a good year. Well, they steelhead were able, despite the low rains, were able to get in spawn and release. So, and oh, the other thing interesting is we encountered a lot of um, California freshwater shrimp. So, this graph shows um, the capture results uh, uh, relating to flow. So the USGS gauge mean daily flow is in the black line there. And um, you can see that we captured most of our fish at end of April, early May. Uh, the color codes indicate uh, whether or not they were um, hatchery fish. So snout means we detected a coated wire tag in the snout. Um, green is uh, represents natural origin fish we scanned and there were no uh, tags orange uh, is uh, there were a large group that we just didn't um, didn't scan so it's unknown whether or not they're hatchery origin so as i indicated we're we're excited uh and the uh, the initial results are are promising in that um, as the pie graph on the right shows a large fraction of the smolts we captured were um, natural origin. Uh, I expected to see uh, mostly um, smolts from the um, hatchery releases of juveniles in the previous fall, but I was um, pleasantly um, surprised to see that was not the case. Um, and of course, this, this is very preliminary, so we're going to be looking more closely at it and have additional years um, uh, of data to uh, to make the findings more robust. And I had to throw in some pictures at the end. We got this little metal in there. He uh, he got out safely and unharmed. Uh, quite a few pond turtles, which are, are really great. Here's the. Uh, what I thought was the California roach, I learned something from Nancy today, Tamales roach, I'm gonna to have to find out more about that. Um, got a, quite a few uh, uh, Pacific lampreys, both adults and juveniles, the amicetes. And as I said, a, a lot of California freshwater shrimp. Um, we uh, Here's a closer look at the trap. Um, we left a little gap in the in the weir panels to allow adult steelhead to um, pass upstream to spawn. We captured uh, a number of them coming back down into the trap. The, this is a pair that was milling around just upstream uh, one day. And of course, there were a lot of people uh, contributing to this um, project. You know, these trapping efforts, as uh, I'm sure Eric can tell you, uh, are labor intensive. We got to come out every day and process the fish, uh, in addition to the installation and maintenance and removal of the of the trap itself. Uh, but we had a lot of fun doing it, as you can tell. And I want to uh, just mention a special thanks to the Brazil family who uh, have been tremendous partners with us and have allowed us to uh, put the trap on their property, and uh, they very enthusiastic about uh, helping us move the uh, recovery goals forward in Walker Creek. So that's it for me. David, thank you very, very much. And um, 
I've got a series of questions that I've got for all three of you so far, but I want to make sure we uh, bring on Jody now. And, and let me pause and just say thank you, Monica, as well. And thank you for joining us. Um, glad, David, you invited Monica and glad, Monica, you're here. So when we come back to question and answer, let's uh, make sure and have Monica participate and Eric as well from Marin Water. So with that, let's, let's turn to our last panelist, um, Jody. Carrier from the NOAA Fisheries, and she's the uh, Natural Resources Management Sp Specialist with NOAA Fisheries. The title of, of her presentation is Recovery Targets and Initiatives for CCC COHO in Walker Creek. And uh, I, I'll, I use that acronym purposely and in jest and appreciate, David, your, your point about what does it stand for? It's always good to remind ourselves, and Sarah, thank you in the chat, you put the, the full acronym description. Um, so, so Jody, you've got that to reference, and then thank you, Jody, for giving us the bigger picture of, of how we're thinking about coho throughout the Central Coast and then into Walker Creek. Jody, the floor is yours for next 10 minutes or so. Thank you, David. Um, thank you, everyone, for having me. Can you guys see the screen? Your slide sorter is showing. Yeah. And then if you go to show presentation mode. Yep, up and running. I see your lead slide now. Beautiful picture. Okay, so you can see the lead slide. You're not seeing the note slides? Correct. Okay, great. Okay, so I will go through this pretty quickly, you guys. Um, apologies to all my other partners who've probably seen this a couple of times that are here. Um, so NIMS considers Walker Creek to be a very important watershed for the recovery of our, of our CCC coho in Walker Creek. Um, and Walker Creek is very lucky to have such a passionate group of folks um, working towards recovery and really considering this an important watershed for both the species and while also considering um, you know, the, com the community members and what's best, best for these, for you guys. Um, so recovery is, our, our mission from NIMPS is to promote recovery and to get species off of the endangered species list. And we do that through um, first starting with a plan. Our recovery plan is, uh, you know, it, just, it describes how the, the species can be recovered. It's a non-regulatory guidance document. It's meant for a broad group, a broad audience um, to reference. It guides our actions, our funding, our outreach tools. It's a very intensive process on uh, developing this plan. It's based on best available science. Um, looking at interpopulation dynamics. We, we developed very specific population criteria and benchmarks within the plans. And it's meant for um, partners, it's private, private landowners. It's, it's, it's an, like I said, it's non-regulatory. So this just isn't just for agencies. We need people out on the landscape um, helping us. And that's gonna be kind of a resonating theme throughout my talk is um, we can't do it alone. So specifically for Walker Creek, um, the Central California Coast, which is our CCC coho, ESU, which is the evolutionarily significant unit. So we break populations of fish down into smaller segments based on genetics and, and relatedness and geography. Um, so the CCC coho extend from Humboldt all the way down to Santa Cruz. Um, and in the recovery plan, we break the, that group of fish down into 28 focus populations and 11 supplemental populations. Um, a lot of this is, is genetics and biological population jargon, uh, diversity strata. So looking at that a little bit more, I know that this is probably really hard to see, but looking at just our coastal strata, um, which is here, which includes uh, the Russian River, which is one of the bigger um, populations. Then we've got Walker Creek and Lagunitas Creek as our um, independent or potentially independent populations, um, meaning 
they can function on their own and don't need input from any other watershed. Whereas some of these other smaller creeks may need input from, from nearby uh, watersheds. I'm gonna just keep narrowing it down till we get specifically to Walker. So here we've got, of course, our Russian Salmon Creek, Walker Creek, um, Lagunitas, and Redwood Creek, which, which is the coastal diversity strata. So these are mo most closely related genetically. So for Walker Creek specifically, um, in the recovery plan, we use something called intrinsic potential to look at um, habitat suitability. Uh, and that's based on things like gradient, barriers, temperature, um, specifically for coho salmon. So here we've got some of this lighter blue, that's low potential for good habitat. Um, and then the blue, the dark blue is where we get better potential um, or suitability for coho salmon. So these are the areas that we're really looking at when we're looking at recovery. And then the red is our high priority, which covers most of the main stem. And then um, we get into like a phase one or phase two for, and this is just looking at if we wanna focus in on exactly where we need to do um, restoration or, or recovery efforts, where, where should we focus those efforts? Um, Delisting criteria, as I mentioned, our goal for re recovery planning and all of the, these efforts are to get the species off the list. Um, intrinsic potential and Walker Creek specifically, there's 600 or 67, I think 0.6 miles of potential habitat. And then there's some comp complicated formulas and models which come up with um, an estimated target for downlisting and then ultimately delisting the species. So we ultimately would love to see 2,600 spawning adults in Walker Creek in order for the species to be even considered for delisting. So we've got a ways to go. Um, these are just uh, ex, you know, taken directly out of the recovery plan. Um, just kind of a snapshot overview of what we're looking at in Walker Creek how big the watershed, how much habitat is potential for um, rest or for restoration and recovery. Uh, then we've got some adult spawning estimates. Again, and then we this estimate ultimately that's 2,600 something to note here was uh, 100 years out from when the recovery plan was written. So we're not expecting it to happen overnight. Um, and then it, the recovery plan also breaks down um, threats and current conditions. Again, just kind of trying to zero in where we should focus those efforts, um, where the needs are the highest. And I'm gonna, I know that this is a lot of words, but I could provide links to the recovery plan and the um, this slideshow after I present. Another one just representing the, the threats and needs. And I, I would like to, to point out that some of this is a bit dated since we have such amazing partners in the watershed like the RCD um, doing, you know, working with the landowners to get restoration happening. We've got a lot more, I think, improved habitat in this watershed since the recovery plan was written. Dave um, touched on this a little bit this is a, a very dated slide, but talking about the goals um, when the Department of Fish and Wildlife Service was looking at reintroductions into the creek um, and doing the genetics to ensure that we're getting some natural production in the creek. And as Dave highlighted, it's looking um, really promising that we're actually, you know, it's not just uh, hatchery fish, that they're actually reproducing and we're getting some some natural reproduction, which is really exciting. And then this slide is just a summary of all of the releases, kind of a different a representation from what Dave showed in graph form of how many adults, juveniles, and smolts have been released in the watershed and in the surveys, um, which haven't always been consistent I, as far as I understand. Um, 
throughout the years of how and when access was available. But it's all the data that we have now, and it's really exciting to see some more data coming out of the watershed with other partners now. Um, and then I've got a little soapbox. Um, we cannot do this alone. Recovery uh, takes all of us. And uh, just making a plea for help, really. Um, we're on a trajectory with endangered species that everyone knows is not great. I won't go into the doom and gloom of it all, but it's it's really, we're not, even with the restoration and all the good, good work all folks are doing, we're not keeping up. Um, so we've got some exciting funding opportunities coming out um, within the next five years through NIMPS for private landowners, for partners. And I'm just gonna put out a little, little blip um, that we'd welcome any partnership opportunities, especially in the, in the watersheds um, to get some funding out, to get some good things happening. Another initiative that NIMS came out with in 2016 for critically endangered species. These are species that we consider to likely go extinct if we don't do more. Um, and coho salmon, I think we had 13 species that we included in this initiative and coho salmon, CCC coho, <clears throat> Uh, met the mark. So I've got links to the, this plan, um, but what I really wanted to highlight in this, some of our priorities within this plan, <clears throat> and it's been renewed twice now through 2025, um, we're looking at watershed scale restoration, improving in stream flows, fish need water, um, continue to expand the, the captive broodstock program, so the reintroduction of fish from the conservation hatchery up at Warm Springs will continue. Um, but I wanted to highlight <clears throat> this partnering aspect. We consider it a priority and I'm always welcome, welcome any new partnerships or even conversations to even think about a partnership. Um, and then monitoring re and research, which uh, lots of our partners are doing in the watershed, which is really exciting. And then my last slide, um, has a video that I will not play, but I'll put it in the link for you to watch on your own, kind of um, giving an overview of the Species in the Spotlight initiative and what we're trying to do specifically with uh, CCC coho in our area. And with that, I'm going to stop sharing and give you some links. <laughs> Fantastic, Jody. Thank you, especially early with those maps in the early part of your slides and then moving into the priority planning and ways that we might think about, NCL could think about weighing in and supporting continued planning and implementation for recovery. Um, so please do share those links for that species in the spotlight and other, and even that infrastructure bill. Um, I do see a couple hands already raised so please remember you can put questions in the chat this is a time when we will open up and start to pose questions and have a discussion with the panelists um, first can you just uh, thank them i think just a, a wonderful group of presentations and really gave us a great perspective on how they're working together and and working with different levels of success and progress so thank you all for making the time today and sharing your contributions um, I want to, I, I will come to Nona and then actually I'm going to come to Ed first. So Ed, get ready. Um, but I just have a simple biology question that any one of the panelists, I'd welcome you just giving us the context. Some of us know this and some of us may not, but um, could, could someone just explain the life cycle of coho and, and kind of the, what I understand to be a, a three year, um, in uh, strong integrity to cohorts across three years uh, that is different than steelhead or other uh, anadromous fish. In other words, tight, tight populations in each year, right? Uh, anyway, I'm, I'm probably fumbling because I don't know enough and I want to open it up and have any one of the biologists please explain that and why it's important in coho recovery. I can take a crack at it. Great, David, thank you. And then the others can correct me where I'm wrong. Uh, but uh, so co salmon are one of five Pacific um, salmon, and, and uh, they're semiparous, which means they come up, they spawn, and they die. 
Um, steelhead, on the other hand, are iteriparous. Uh, so a portion of them will, after spawning, will return to the ocean and can um, uh, survive for a number of years after and, and repeatedly spawn. So, but for coho salmon, uh, they have a three year life um, history. So uh, the adults come up in the uh, fall and early winter and spawn and um, the eggs embryos uh, incubate uh, for, uh, I'm gonna say 30 to 60, maybe 90 days. Um, anyway, they, the, the young uh, emerge, the fry emerge in the spring and um, uh, rear through the summer and the following winter. And uh, by that time, they're ready to go out. Uh, they begin, begin the process of smultification, uh, which uh, allows them to um, uh, tolerate uh, salt water. And they move down through the streams and uh, into the estuary and, and then out to the ocean. They live in the ocean for two years and come back as adults. Uh, there's a lot more um, nuance to all of that, but um, that's the basic life cycle. That, that's a great description. And, and do they stay tight within that three years? Is there ever a four-year fish or a two-year fish? Um, tr traditionally, uh, biologists have uh, sort of considered sam uh, coho salmon to be very, um, you know, strict in that three-year life uh, history. But uh, we are seeing more and more um, uh, that, for example, the juveniles may stay uh, and not uh, out migrate as um, as smolts that first spring. Sometimes a, a small proportion of them will overwinter. I think some of it has to do with uh, you know habitat availability and the conditions they're facing. Sometimes they'll um, they'll stay in the estuary or even move back up into the streams. Uh, but I have not heard any um, adults uh, surviving to reproduce uh, at a later time. Maybe Eric can. Um, describe that better than I, but that's my understanding. Yeah, I, I think that's generally correct. Um, we're seeing in Lagunitas Creek, uh, in some years we get um, a, a small percentage of fish that stayed in Lagunitas Creek for two years, um, particularly following a drought year um, when if fish didn't really have good opportunity to leave the streams. They'll spend another summer and they'll go out at year two. And we're, um, we actually have been focusing on putting some tags in those fish to see if they come, if they spend only six months in the ocean and they come back as a three-year-old fish, essentially two years in, two and a half years in, fresh water six months in the ocean, or if they spend a year and a half and they come back as four-year-old fish um, or some combination of that. Um, and I don't want to forget about the jacks. Um, so there are uh, male coho that come back after only six months in the ocean or, or so. And these are small males that are um, sexually mature, but, you know, are only maybe 16 inches long. And uh, so they only live for two years total, but uh, they, they, they come back early. And an advantage of that is that um, they will mix their genes in with the other cohorts so that the, sep the, the three year classes do have some genetic flow between them. Yeah, great, great. Very helpful, both of you, thank you. Definitely there's some questions in the chat we'll get to. Um, Ed, I cut you off earlier, so I'm gonna give you prerogative. Nona, please excuse me, then we'll come to you. <laughs> Ed, <Okay>. please. <laughs> okay, thank, thank you, David. Great presentations, I'm learning a lot. You know, I've lived in Marin County for 80 years and still learning about the fish in Marin County. One thing about Walker Creek, it's over 90% is privately owned land. And the cooperation from the ranchers is really imperative. And it's great that, example, the Bazil Ranch, there's a lot of good things happening there. But over the years, last say two or three years, there's been a lot of discussion on introduction of beavers. 
Now, if you introduce beavers, you're going to spread the footprint of the creeks and, and tributaries out wide. And I don't know if, if that's a positive thing or negative thing, but, uh, and they also talked about woody debris, especially in Lagunitas Creek, but I haven't seen discussion on woody debris on Walker because maybe it's all in private land, but beavers and woody debris are the things I want to talk about or have somebody discuss them, positive and negatives. Thank you. So who might want to start or, or maybe a couple of you have different responses to either or both topics? Eric, well, just unmuted. Go for it, Eric. And then I see Sarah. So Eric and then Sarah. I, I, I'm going to take the beaver one just because I'm wearing my beaver hat today. <laughs> um, and uh, yeah, there's been a lot of research to show that coho salmon uh, do very well in streams with beavers. So uh, beavers create these really ideal nurseries with their, their ponds. Um, juvenile coho love living in slower water with a lot of wood for, for shelter. And that's what wood beaver ponds do. Um, it's also been shown that, that adults can get over beaver dams really quite easily. So there's a, a, uh, a real benefit to having beavers in uh, streams for coho. Now, other benefits of having beavers in a stream, particularly in an agriculturally um, dominated watershed is raising the water table um, it basically provides free irrigation to low-lying areas adjacent to streams. And in arid landscapes in the West, it's been shown that beavers um, have enormous benefits for forage production and <laughs> fire protection. Um, so, uh, but that, they take, they take maintenance. So beavers will also um, plug culverts. And, and so uh, it's not all positive. They need, uh, they, they create some more work, but some benefits. Uh, I, I would love to see beavers return to Marin County. They were here naturally and were hunted out. And there's currently an effort to reintroduce them to Lagunitas Creek and uh, Walker is a little bit more tricky just because of all of the property owners and, and getting real, real buy-in from the, the agricultural community. I'll also just chime in, Ed, having worked in Napa for nearly 20 years where beavers uh, showed up just naturally and um, they weren't reintroduced, but they showed up and you all know Napa, of course, is wall-to-wall -wall vineyards. The Napa River has, um, many, many beaver dams. I was involved with fisheries monitoring there and um, looking at those those dams and really the dams just don't persist year to year. They, they wash out relatively easily. Um, so the concern about um, flooding adjacent uh, properties is, in my experience, 20 years of looking at it, um, really minimal or to non-existent. It, that, that was never really a conflict um, in, that, in that setting. And I think the Walker Creek is a very similar setting where um, you know, the, the, it just takes maybe 500 CFS, which is a very small winter storm to, to, to dissipate the, the beaver dam. Um, we all have this kind of mental image of a, of a semi-permanent kind of meadow, mountain meadow beaver dam with a lodge, um, but that's not really the kind of dams that uh, beavers build in, this, in these coastal streams where they really just construct a, a small uh, dam and then um, they're a seasonal. They, they build them and then they get washed out and then they rebuild them and they get washed out. And the benefits to fish, um, as Eric said, are, are huge. So they're essentially creating um, the exact same habitat that we're spending millions of dollars designing and implementing um, for, for essentially for free. And there are, there are maintenance concerns. There are definitely landowner education um, efforts that need, to, that need to go with this. But um, in my experience, it, um, it really just, it was, a, it was a net positive for sure. Let me remind folks, Jonathan, in your slide, you shared what's called the hydrograph, the flow out of Sulahuli, and uh, you shared, uh, I think it was the October storms that reached uh, 2,000 cubic feet a second. So just to give context in that, that large storm, we're easily going to eclipse the 500 you just quoted. 
Sarah, I think you had some things you wanted to share on this topic. Well, I wanted to touch on the large woody debris um, sure. aspect. And I did, as they were talking about uh, beavers and wildfire and, and some other benefits, I put a couple of links in there with Dr. Emily Fairfax's work, which she's just absolutely amazing. Um, so yeah, as far as large woody debris add, I mean, that's part of what Jonathan mentioned with the millions of dollars we're spending, you know, mimicking and doing some of these processes and what Eric Ellinger was mentioning, Coho preferring that cover, preferring the deep pools, slow moving water. That's the, some of the results that you get with introducing large woody debris into the system. You have passive recruitment, you have active recruitment. Um, active recruitment is us as restorationists putting it in there. It's all engineered and spec'd out. But as far as from a fisheries point of view, the upstream end tends to slow down the velocities of the water. So on the downstream end, the fish can kind of catch their breath, so to speak, and enjoy some slow moving water. As well, hydraulically on the downstream end, there tends to be some scouring that goes on. So you start getting these nice deep pools where summer refugia is had for juveniles to be able to hang out there and cool down in the shade. And it also provides some protection from predators and also again, some shade, so water quality benefits. And then you have your aquatic insects breaking down and eating that wood, which then the fish are eating the insects. So nutrient recycling um, going on there as well. But that will be part of uh, the project that I'm managing on behalf of the RCD on the lower Walker Creek, where we're looking at creating side channels and alcove habitat and adding more complexity with having the wood in stream, because naturally that's what happened before humans came in and decided they wanted to start cleaning out the creeks. Um, a messy creek is a good creek. So having that in there is, is definitely key habitat features. Thank you. No, very helpful, all of you. Um, Ed, good? I'm gonna move on. All right, great. Nona, I think you're up next. Yeah, okay. Well, this has been such a comprehensive presentation that I wish you know, it, it really deserves a wider audience. And I'm not certain whether that's going to be possible. But in any case, just really, really fascinating. Uh, it's also interesting because we on the east side <laughs> of Marin County are so Lagunitas Creek centered because it's our water supply that we ignore Walker Creek. And yet, I one little couple of little factoids kind of popped out of the presentations. One of them is that there are more apparently more suitable habitat miles in the log in the Walker Creek watershed than the Lagunitas. I saw something like 67 miles or so in around 64, something like that. Maybe you guys can, can correct me. The other is a little is a factoid that, that Ed is already aware of apparently and that is it popped out in Jody's presentation and that is that 97 around 97 percent of Walker Creek is in private lands, whereas I suspect that it's flipped, that probably roughly 90% of Lagunitas Creek is in public. Is that, is that a correct inference? Um, and it also probably explains why there's now so much opportunity for uh, the RCT, RCD to be involved in Walker because that is probably a much more complicated if you began to point out, I think, much more complicated um, matter of working with landowners than, uh, than Lagunitas, which is, as I suggest, almost entirely public. Maybe somebody wants to comment on that, but it's, I think it's a really interesting thing for us to have this wonderful exposure to what's going on in Walker Creek. Okay, let's take them one at a time. So Noni, you posed two topics. I'm going to ask, you know, Jody and then and then others involved with regional planning and or really familiar with Lagunitas and Walker, either in the big central California ESU or just comparing Walker and Lagunitas, what are, how do you compare the potential habitat and the prioritization of working in either or both at the same time? Um, and so Jody, maybe please start with you about that, the way your map presented the potential habitat and the miles that are there. Sure, no, those are great questions. Um, you're correct, and it's amazing that you picked that up on that slide that uh, Walker actually shows up as having, you know, an additional th three miles more of intrinsic potential habitat than Lagunitas. And the differences in uh, potential for implementation, working with public agencies versus private landowners definitely creates different challenges as well as opportunities, I think. 
um, you know, there's, there's restrictions and opportunities on both sides. You could weigh the pros and cons. Um, but the, the work that the RCD and MALT and others that have, have done, you know, historically in the last decade in the watershed to, to make those um, ties with the landowners and do the restoration work has really, really kind of put Walker on the map for the agencies as, wow, this, this watershed has great potential. Um, and, and one of the first rules of reintroductions uh, of, of species, endangered species, is to make sure that the habitat is ready to hold those, to hold and support those species. Um, so a lot more work to do, but, but just incredible the work that has been done already. Um, and Lagunitas, you know, Marin Water is, is, is one of our major players and they're doing amazing work with restoration. Um, they've got the one agency, they've got deeper funding pockets. So there's, it's different, you know, they don't have to write a, a bunch of grants and put together a bunch of stakeholders and they do have to go through a lot of TAC meetings and review. <laughs> But um, but yeah, there's there's definitely pros and cons. But Walker Creek has huge potential, and it's on everybody's radar. It is a great watershed for for coho recovery. Yeah, yeah, thanks. Yeah. Other I can only, uh, oh, yeah, I, ahead, can, I can only shudder. Oh no, no, you just muted. You just, I can only go. shudder, shudder at the recollection in the early '70s of actually being in a little plane and flying over potential reservoir sites in West Marin, one of them was on the north side of Mount Verdell, and then another one, of course, was the Lillooly, and another one was the middle fork of Walker Creek, which, I mean, not the middle fork, but the middle would be probably downstream between Walker Ranch and the, and the confluence of, of, um, of Chileno Creek, and that there geologically, it was a perfect place for a reservoir, so uh, thank goodness that would have cut off even more habitat. So just, just a, a recollection of things that didn't happen, which is fortunate. Yeah, other other panelists that want to, you know, pick up a thread uh, relative to this topic, importance of working in the working land and in public land, or the, the difference of Walker and Lagunitas Creeks. Nancy, I see you unmuted. Yeah, I, I just wanted to uh, chime in about that because I, I don't think it's difficult. It's just different. Um, so you know, working in for, so I've been working in Walker Creek for about 25 years now. And so Walker Creek, when you, it's all about very much so about trusting relationships with ranching community. So if you, and you can't just do that with uh, one rancher, it's kind of like you need both sides of the creek. So, you need both ranchers on board. And you're talking about really large or, or lengthy stretches. So a mile of creek. If you can get two ranchers, a mile of creek, that's like, wow, okay, now we're in business. Now we're doing something, right? So, and you've got to kind of maintain those relationships. Um, and it might mean that you do a small little dinky project that isn't that meaningful, <laughs> right? Um, to start off, just to develop that relationship. Okay, so then you kind of go into Lagunitas Creek and you're dealing with many, many, um, you know, streamside homeowners, for example, um, or you're dealing with, uh, you know, the water district or many different entities. I remember going to my first Lagunitas um, TAC meeting um, was for a water board grant that we had. And there were, I was shocked that there were 12 different organizations sitting at the table to decide what to do on a project. <laughs> and so I've been used to working with just a couple of ranchers, you know, a couple of partners. So it's just a very different watershed to be in. Um, I think um, to answer your question, Nona, and, and I think it calls to the importance of really just maintaining those relationships with the ranching community. Um, you know, and, and that is done so in a different way. And I think that's why the RCD is kind of primed in that watershed to do that because our board are, you know, is really existing all of ranching, ranchers who know these people, you know, pretty, pretty well. That's great. Thanks um, very much. Yeah, I, I'm gonna, Terry, I see you, we'll come to you next, but first I think there was a, ahead of you was a question in the chat. And so I'm gonna oh. ask Jeff, yeah. 
Yeah, real quick though, David, um, I appreciate that Jody mentioned malt because you know, Jim Jensen on the staff did a lot to yeah. connect the agencies with our landowners um, in, in the watershed, including Walker Creek and others to facilitate all this work. And, and I know they've uh, been increasing the amount of money they're granting to landowners for this work as well. So um, just want folks to- No, and good, good point. Nancy had in a budget uh, slide, I think, you know, recognition of malt's contributions financially, but that as partners, they're also out there. So, so great point. Go ahead, Jeff, in the, in the chat might be a question. All right, so just wrapping back to George Clyde's and it's, it's been uh, interest, it's been answered in somewhat, but wanted to highlight it. George asked in Walker Creek, are there any other salmon species beyond coho um, as have been found in Lagunitas Creek? Um, and and I'll, I'll add on to that, you know, David, you said there's five uh, species, I'm just curious, you know, with whether Walker Creek or across this region of planning, Jody, you too, what are we talking about and what are we seeing both in Walker and elsewhere? So I'll try that one. Um, uh, for the department, coho salmon is clearly the priority. Um, they are endangered, steelhead are threatened, um, uh, uh, which suggests that coho are, are much uh, more at risk of extinction. Um, but we are finding, um, as I indicated in my presentation, we're finding steelhead in the watershed, and uh, you know we're we're just getting started on trying to understand um, the biology and ecology there. Um, so uh, I still think it's an open question, you know, with uh, respect to other salmonids. Um, you know, in Lagunitas, they're finding just about everything in there. So uh, <laughs> I wouldn't be surprised. Um, you know, if we found some Chinook or even uh, some of the others, so in Walker Creek. Others on the panel, thanks, Dad. Eric, I see you. And yeah, I, I, I'll just echo what what David just said. Um, this past year, we saw um, coho and steelhead, which we see every year. Chinook, we see most years, um, but we also saw pink salmon and chum salmon, uh, which are are pretty unusual. Um, and in Walker Creek, uh, we just have not looked hard enough. I, but I suspect that those other species do show up. Um, chum salmon are known to stray from their natal stream. They, they, they wander around more than some of the other species. And no reason to think that they couldn't find Walker Creek and, and get in there periodically. Um, and in the lower reaches where uh, we don't have uh, access or we don't have access permission from some of the uh, landowners, I suspect there, there is Chinook spawning uh, periodically in there. We just, I, I'd, I'd love to look for them. Yeah, good, Thank you. helpful. Thank you. Um, Terry, you're up. Thank you. I'm actually kind of circling back to beavers. Um, I just wanted people to know that Eric is speaking at our September Parks and Open Space meeting on beavers. And um, as Eric and Jonathan know, and, and a lot of you who also attend Parks and Open Space, there's a lot of overlap and uh, between, I mean, they gave presentations on the Lagunitas Creek salmon there. And I just wanted people to know that we do coordinate, that David and I do coordinate on these topics, but that September's meeting is going to have um, some working lands thoughts in it. So I wanted, uh, this is the parks and open space meeting. So I just wanted to note that not only is Eric speaking on beavers at that meeting, but we also have uh, Libby Portzig from Point Blue talking about their agricultural monitoring um, of biodiversity and also Pelayo Alvarez of um, Audubon's conservation ranching program speaking there as well. And um, they're kind of overlap meetings between parks and open space and agriculture and just wanted to make sure you all knew about that. Thanks. Terry, you took care of one of my to-dos in the wrap-up. Um, so I'm looking to see if there are other questions of our panelists. Um, I not have a couple, chat, not in the chat. I have a couple I, I, I want, and we, we still are doing well time-wise. Um, 
I first want to kind of come back to Sarah, you know, you mentioned the the monitoring and the the effort to look in the estuary for priority restoration projects. And David, you you shared with us I'm uh, no, I'm sorry, Jonathan, you shared with us the monitoring in Arroyo Sasol. And I'm just curious, I'm going to use those two places in the watershed and ask you all on the panel, how are you informing each other about prioritization of different potential habitat and different projects going forward? How do you coordinate and how do you learn and decide what's a priority and where in the watershed? Um, I'm happy to go first on this one, if you don't mind, Jonathan. So the website that I, that I totally fumbled on trying to get us to was kind of like the birthing of that was really trying to keep everybody on the same page. So there's two things. There's also, um, we have these Walker Creek meetings, but before I hit on that, uh, we were having landowners in Walker Creek that were just getting a little confused. I'm like, wait, are you here for this project? Are you here for that project? And I know in the Brazil ranch where, you know, a lot of us are doing different projects out there. So it really developed this need to create a website, really delineating the different projects and who the key contacts are that are working on those projects. That's the information part. But as far as the coordinating part, back in the before times, before the pandemic hit, um, Jody was so fabulous. Her and Bob Cooey with National Marine Fisheries Service were pulling us together for doing conceptual life cycle monitoring, life cycle modeling, uh, work group meetings. So we were all at the same table together in person uh, inside of the Water District building talking about our different projects and the overlap and really um, coordinating amongst that. But obviously the project actions and activities that you look at in the upper reaches of the watershed are really fossil, going to be significantly different than an ecotone um, estuarine zone transition. Jonathan, do you want to add anything or Jody? I do see David's hand up, but go ahead, Jonathan, if you're ready. I, I don't have much to add. I would just say we've been um, really leaning on and benefiting from RCD's um, leadership in that role as coordinator. And I, I worked for the Napa RCD for years and years. So I think it's a, it's a great kind of neutral Switzerland-esque uh, role for the RCD to really keep us all, um, you know, all the participants honest and participating. So yeah, we're, we're happy to um, support that as much as possible. David, please, and, your, your hands up, go, yes. Yeah, I was just gonna uh, jump on that. And um, uh, I think uh, Sarah nailed it with this uh, sort of large stakeholder group interagency um, effort to develop a, a life cycle model, a conceptual life cycle model. But, uh, you know, the, the underlying uh, uh, goal there is to identify potential limiting factors for the species. And I, I think that's another important reason that I didn't mention in my presentation, how, how and why the monitoring uh, can really contribute to that. You know, it, it can really help us understand um, uh, what's happening at each life stage and which one is potentially most limiting. And that can drive, um, uh, or should have a major influence on the restoration planning that occurs. Um, you don't wanna be pouring all your money into um, a, a habitat feature or a uh, a life stage that's that's not really uh, you know keeping the population down. So um, uh, that will take some time. But uh, in terms of how to prioritize actions, I think that should be a major driving force. Yeah, Sarah, I see your hand up again. Continue with this thread. Yeah, just really quick. Um... Because coordination is so huge. I mean, with any kind of project, especially when you're looking at a watershed scale, it's it's massive. And and one thing I left out while I was running through my presentation is that this uh, lower Walker Creek project that uh, we're managing right now has a technical advisory committee. And on that technical advisory committee, we have National Marine Fisheries Service, we have Department of Fish and Wildlife, we have NOAA uh, Restoration Center, we have NRCS, we have MOLT, um, we also have uh, a land, a private property owner that's a part of the TAC and the Regional Water Quality Control Board as well. And I probably left somebody else out, but all to say that, you know, we're really trying to cohesively work together and keep each other uh, on point as far as who's doing what and where in the watershed and how we can support each other with that. Great, great. Um, I'm going to ask maybe two more. I'm going to start with Jody uh, with this question and see how other panelists want to chime in. But Jody, thank you for sharing those 
very long term and large goals for downgrading and 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 delisting um, won't likely be in any of our lifetimes. <laughs> um, but so I want to ask more near term: What are signs of progress towards downlisting and delisting, either in Walker or other places? Like, how are you? How are you, in, in, as the holder of the bigger picture, seeing progress? Uh, <laughs> um, again, I'm going to try to avoid the doom and gloom. Sure. But it's a downward trajectory across yeah. the board. Yeah, uh, we, we're holding on to the small successes, but what we're doing is not enough. We need to think bigger, faster, more. Um, it, it's kind of our overarching message is, uh, however, <laughs> in holding on to the successes and having the passionate group that we do, um, I've seen amazing, uh, given you know all the hurdles that it takes to get some of this, this stuff implemented, um, amazing progress within this group and in these watersheds. The fact that Lagunitas to our south is holding on um, is really hopeful. The fact that we have a conservation hatchery, you know, studying the genetics and, and keeping that um, on, on par across the watershed where we can do reintroductions. The fact that we're seeing natural origin and reproduction in the watershed, all of this gives us hope. And, you know, again, all of the, uh, the amazing work that's been done with malt and RCD thus far, uh, making this more suitable for the recovery. Um, but in general, you know, the trends are either holding steady or declining. Yeah, no sobering, and I appreciate the chance to be candid. So thank you. Um, I am reminded, though, and and back to the earlier conversation about which watershed, what type of of uh, either public or, or private holding that the Russian River is also that that effort is a combination of public and private lands and partnerships. So it's not unprecedented to be working across both types of land holdings and making either making progress or keeping a population uh, at a baseline. Um, since you mentioned it, Jody, I'm going to pick up my last question then and it'll be actually I think for David. Um, and I'm just curious, you, you did have that pie chart that talked about the pairings of of um, released fish, natural pairings, and then released in natural. And I think that was in Salmon Creek up in up in Sonoma County, correct? Um, right. Just what are the implications for straying and and the opportunity? The, what what does that result uh, communicate about potential for coho to stray and and support populations in other watersheds? Have you thought about that yet, or we not don't know enough yet? Yeah, I don't know much about string other than just sort of general understanding of the literature. Um, the closer the, the watersheds are to each other, the more likely you're, you're uh, to have some string. Um, for the smaller populations, as, as Jody uh, indicated, uh, you know, their, their risk of, um, of blinking out due to some sto stochastic event is is greater than a larger watershed, so they're more likely to, to uh, benefit or rely on these larger nearby larger watersheds to, you know, reestablish bounding populations or to supplement them before they blink out. Um, and I think just uh, with Walker Creek, you know, it's large enough, has enough potential habitat uh, to where it can be one of those source. Uh, populations potentially um, and can help uh, sort of uh, reestablish that link of watersheds uh, north to south. You know, we have a lot of work going on in the Russian, we're maintaining a population there. Uh, Lagunitas is kind of the, um, the star in the ESU. Uh, and so, and Walker Creek can kind of bring those, um, uh, a little continuity between those two. Uh, Two populations. Others thoughts, Nancy. I see you raised your hand. Yeah. I'm sorry. This is actually unrelated. So if there's another question. Okay. No, not another question. Just uh, anyone else from the panel on that topic or how the the populations of different watersheds uh, relate to each other. If not, that's okay too. Just thank you, David, for your for sharing the thoughts that you did. I'll just say one quick thing about that. Um, the technology that uh, David was discussing, um, pit tagging, uh, is really 
teaching us a lot about the interconnectedness of these different watersheds. So um, Marin Water now has three antennas in the Lagunitas watershed, and we can detect fish moving uh, every which way, not just the upstream adults and the downstream smolts, but we're seeing that juveniles will be born in one stream and move into another. Um, we've picked up Walker Creek fish on our antenna, so they were released in Walker Creek. Instead of going upstream, they went into Tamales Bay and then into Lagunitas. Um, fish from Santa Cruz have been seen north of us. So we're, we're learning a lot about how these fish move around and stray. And, um, and that, that's, it's a really hopeful sign because um, they are um, refreshing their genetics and, uh, and these are very small populations that are prone to be becoming inbred. And um, so that, that periodic mixing is really, a, a, it, it's good for their survival. Yeah, great. Um, Nancy, please go ahead and then we'll, we'll begin to wrap up the panel, yeah. I just wanted to offer up a little piece of information to, to David because you had talked about in your presentation that about Chileno Valley and Chileno Creek and how um, you had not done any monitoring in that uh, creek yet. And um, so we're uncertain about populations there. But to let you know that there have been sightings of, of fish there. And um, as a matter of fact, uh, one day, some years back, for those of you who remember Bill Cox, um, we were out next to the creek on Sally Gill's ranch. And um, he said, no, I don't think there's probably any fish that come up this far. And then out leaped a fish out of the creek as we were speaking, so <laughs> right on cue. So anyway, just to let you know that they do go up as far as the Gill Ranch. Yeah, that's thank you for sharing that. And they never read the textbooks. So. <laughs> <laughs> I'd, I would love to uh, uh, do some more outreach in the Chileno Creek area and, and maybe get an antenna set up there someday. We can help you do that. We, there are some great um, ranchers in that stretch. Awesome. Okay. Well, maybe with that, we'll we'll uh, wrap up the panel and say thank you all. Um, that's a really good place to remind us all just to let let salmon and and the other wildlife and habitat that we're so concerned with and care about keep teaching us uh, so that we learn and do better at what we're trying to accomplish. So. Uh, wonderful anecdote, Nancy, and thank you, David and Eric, the way you talked about the learning keeps happening. Um, so again, to the panel, just really appreciate it. As Nona said, you know, very comprehensive look at Walker Creek and what's happening and how it's, it's a, a, a true partnership across different kinds of ownership and different kinds of uh, agencies and organizations. Uh, we are recording this, and so maybe we'll entertain a way to make this available broader to our, our Marine Conservation League uh, members and maybe even, you know, broader even still. And uh, I uh, just can't thank the panel enough. We we probably scheduled and rescheduled this. I think this was our third attempt. Uh, and so I know it's hard to get everybody together. And I just really thank your patience. Thank you for your patience and perseverance. So um, I am going to move on to the next topic and uh, uh, try to wrap us up somewhat quickly, but pause enough for conversation about this next topic. So um, in the uh, chat, I've just posted Marine Conservation League agricultural policy that was uh, drafted and approved by the board in November of um, 2015. Um, and I want to put in um, the chat also a link to uh, our website, the Marine Conservation League website uh, called What We Do. And, and the point of giving you that link is that when you go there, you see our issues committees. And as Terry uh, shared, you know, there's coordination across the issues committees. Um, and in fact, Terry helps lead this and helps set this up almost 
is it almost three years ago maybe um we monthly we meet as issues committee chairs to discuss issues that overlap and how are we going to work together on them and when are we going to uh, what's our process for that um agriculture the agricultural policy statement is an overlapping issue and um now with uh, for Point Reyes National Seashore and the general management plan amendment completed. Uh, uh, admittedly, there's uh, another chapter unfolding currently, but there's discussion at, within our issues committees um, to explore revising the agricultural policy statement. And this is a, a normal exercise for MCL. We write policy statements that help us do our work. Uh, and sometimes we revisit them and revise them. So this is a chance just to share with you that there's interest on the part of uh, the committee chairs uh, to revisit this in light of, of what the general management plan amendment has and uh, explore the ways in which uh, we can update that policy relevant to agricultural land use across both public and, and privately held lands. Um, so I'll pause there and say this is a, an invitation to any of you that might want to share in that redrafting and, and uh, we'll probably be tapping a couple of you and maybe a couple of other Marine Conservation League members that have been involved in drafting this. I know we're going to work closely with Terry and the Parks Committee um, and Nona uh, as well. So I'll kind of pause and see what questions there are or um, discussion items about the timeliness of this revision. Um, and I, I can take just raised hands if you want to offer any questions or comments. Okay, a little bit of too much inside baseball, like it means something to the board members, but maybe not the rest of this committee. <laughs> no, no, your I, hand is up. Go ahead. Yeah, no, I just want to emphasize that this is these uh, these are these policies that we come up with are kind of living documents because things change. We learn, most of all, we learn things. And a lot's happening in agriculture. And I think that the, the not only our membership, but the marine public needs to understand what's happening in, in, in the world of marine's agriculture, which occupies about a third of the county land area. So uh, this is an important exercise. We spent a lot of time we had Sally Gale's leadership when we did it before and how many years ago and Judy Teichman also. Uh, who brought really brought to MCL's attention certain certain uh, aspects of of conservation in the agricultural world that we were not we were overlooking. So and it's time now to look. Uh, we didn't look closely at carbon sequestration in those days, for example, uh, and other uh, advances in agriculture changes in the uh, in the agricultural landscape in Wayne County. So. I think that it's really a, a timely thing for people to be involved in that and uh, uh, not spend a lot of time, uh, you know, the Zoom time <laughs> is the limit to what we all have, but to, uh, for a number of eyes to look at it and see how relevant it is to today's uh, uh, working lands. So Jeff, I see your hand, but I'm gonna push uh, the chat and just add, if you've opened the policy statement or, or you later want to go look at it, but I just put in item number one under natural resources in that policy statement as an example of how we did the early work. Uh, and I share the, the, the policy statement there the, the, about wildlife and, and habitat as it pertains to today's meetings. So the policy statement gives us room and gives us focus on things like today's meeting. And then Nona's point about we, we're always learning and, and exploring and revising policy statements. So Jeff, please go ahead. Thanks, David. <clears throat> I, I'm curious if anybody has information on the status of the lawsuit um, that followed the record of decision and wondering you know, what that means for policy within you know, the ag component of the, of the seashore. Does anyone have information on that, Nona? I don't see that as particularly related. I think that's it was important to mention that, David. But the our ag policy really covers uh, both public lands and private lands and uh, non-park lands. So I think it's really a kind of a broad thing. There are some very specific. Oh, oh, I I know what you're talking about, David. Uh, there are some very specific um, parameters within which ag operates on park lands, obviously. 
uh, and those uh, perhaps can be an adjunct. It's hard because we've got ag lands that are in the coastal zone, which are different from lands that are not in the coastal zone. And we have park ag lands. So are there some broad principles that would cover all of those uh, jurisdictional areas? But at the same time, yeah, and, and I, I guess it is, as I sort of think back, it is important to um, make it clear that there are parameters that, uh, that, that limit what can uh, happen in, uh, on, on parklands. I kind of missed miss that point, sorry. I guess, and, and you know, I don't, I'm not going to ask today because we didn't we didn't prepare anybody to come and talk about it. But um, I think it's last week's Point Raise Light has an article about the the steps to mediation that are underway. And you know, as we begin to revise the ag policy statement, maybe we want to um, be patient. We can work on it, but be patient in its completion until that. And that's what I was hinting at. You know, a current chapter evolving. When that mediation is complete and we we understand where uh, things stand for just what you said, Nona, uh, the the stipulations, the requirements for for agricultural land use on the Point Reyes National Seashore. So we might begin to work on on the revision, but then wait and, and make sure that mediation is complete and that there's agreement by all the parties so that we know what it looks yeah. like. Yeah, right. That and also bringing in the indigenous. Bringing that's in uh, the federal yeah. is important because that yeah. has become increasingly an important part of our very good point. Our management decisions. Yeah, okay. yeah, and and MCL has taken up a very serious look at DEI and has done a lot of internal learning as well as infusing DEI into all of our policy statements when we can. So that's very important. Um, other thoughts on that right now? Um, again, maybe a little too much um, behind the scenes work, but um, just wanted to start that that process. And in working with Terry, we we talked about making this uh, you know kind of an opportunity to share that we're going to do that work. Uh, sometimes it can take twelve months, right? Um, we we don't race to get something completed. We want to get it right, not be right. Quoting Brene Brown. Um, all right, um, so let me do a little bit of wrap up uh, if there's nothing more on that topic. Um, do want to just again, uh, the way at the top of the chat is our annual report. I think it's just beautiful both to look at and just speaks volumes to the different things MCL is working on. So hopefully you had a chance to go look at that or you know that it motivates you to want to talk to one of us as board members or members. Um, so please, please avail yourself of our annual report. And David, we should acknowledge Kate and the others who. Kate is so on. Much. That's right. She's on. So she does. Yeah. She and others, and Nona and so many contributors do such an amazing job to get this um, printed and out the door. And I really am grateful for that work. Well, well put, Jeff. Well put. Um, and then uh, Terry did share that the the September. Uh, parks and open space meeting will have a number of really relevant topics and we've we've uh, between Jeff and Terry and I talked about those topics and we'll do some cross posting so that everybody knows about those and those presenters. Um, so please, you know, get that on your calendar. And then our next uh, meeting will be in October. And uh, right now tentatively planned uh, is Marin parks to come and share uh, a complete overview of the sustainable ag portion of Measure A. And we also have tentatively scheduled um, Marin County's uh, agricultural commissioner and, and respective staff to talk about the 2021 uh, Marin crop report as a way to get inside, you know, what kind of crops and production systems are in Marin. Uh, We've done that in the past. It's been a, been a number of years, and I have a few board members and others that are interested in, in seeing a, a review and a recap of that. So those are our two tentative topics, open to other suggestions for topics. And do remember that in January, we got a, a number of, uh, we, we took time with you all to brainstorm potential topics for this committee, and we're using that list always to inform us and shape net future meetings. Um, I don't have too much else unless there's questions either about uh, your future meetings or other things, the annual report. Um, Jeff, am I missing anything else? I don't think so, 
Okay. So again, to our panelists, thank you. And to um, our committee members and, and others that continue to come and, uh, you know, give us the chance to continue our relationships and chances to connect and work together. Appreciate the time. Um, and uh, on behalf of Marine Conservation League, thank you.